now CV reality star Mark Francis Bandelli, who says swearing is ignorant and vulgar, and scientist and also Dr Emma Byrne, who says swearing is a great way of showing emotion and part of our vocabulary. So, I mean, great. Morning to you. Morning. Good morning. Fascinating to hear both of your opinions. So, Mark, you would not swear yourself, or you would maybe when no-one's listening? What's the situation with you? I think you have to be quite careful, because... Uh, I don't think swearing, first of all, is ever necessary. I think it restricts our lexicon. Um, it's just a sort of go-to word that we don't really need to do. I think it's, it's vulgar, it's unnecessary, it's rude, and it, uh, it paints us in the wrong light. So what do you think then, Emma? I mean, Mark Francis is making the point that, you know, is it just because people can't think of anything else to say? It's vulgar, unnecessary. We should actually be using other words instead to express our anger or frustration. See, I'd often wor worried about this because I have used swearing as part of my lexicon, which is fairly varied, but there are certain swear words in English that we tend to go for again and again. I'm quite envious of Spain, which has a much greater variety. But when you do experiments looking at people's vocabulary, uh, those people who have a more fluid and flexible flexible vocabulary, who can think of more words, express themselves more widely, are also the ones who are slightly more likely to use swearing. Oh. So counterintuitively, it's not necessarily that we're using those words in the absence of another word, but that they're used often quite deliberately in order to demonstrate a certain emotion or to, for example, help us withstand pain. And there's some great research that's come out of particularly Australia and New Zealand that shows that judicious use of swearing is a really strong sign of social trust, saying, if I'm using this word, you trust me that I'm not doing it to offend you, and I trust you enough to use this word so that you have this opportunity to trust me. And it's this really complex emotional and social cognition that goes on when so people swear that way. But it's like I a think sign it's... of friendship, then. So, so if Mark is... isn't swearing, are you untrusting of him because he's, he, he's got a sort of an exterior, do you think, and that's the problem? Well, this is the thing. We're really good as social animals in doing something called tone switching. Animals. This is the problem. Ah. <laughs> we want to be distinguished in some way from animals. Oh, you and me, baby, we ain't nothing but mammals. And the okay. thing is, even chimpanzees swear. So That's the problem. <laughs> I do not wish to assimilate. <laughs> so, so the idea that we have taboos in our society, when you, when you potty train chimpanzees, which you really want to do if you're living with a chimpanzee, and then teach them words to do with everything to do with the bathroom, they start using those in the same way that we use our swearing. They use it to express frustration or annoyance, but they also start to tell scatological jokes as well, which I find quite endearing. Mark, Mark have you... Have scatological you, jokes? Do you ever swear? <laughs> On occasion, but... Where? Never Where? In, in what circumstances? Okay, I would you really swear? only do it in my own home, right? Or in the intimacy of an environment in which I felt that I wouldn't be overheard by people who could potentially misconstrue. Right. So you wouldn't like other people way. to hear you swearing? No, because I think it's really quite dreadful, and especially seeing it in the written form. But it's interesting that Mark mentions intimacy because one of the really the uses that aren't very well studied of swearing are the idea that we use swearing sometimes in the bedroom. And I've written some things for, for various you mean women's in the magazines. You mean in, in, the, in bedroom. the bedroom? Right. Mm. In the bedroom. Under the bed sheet. Under the bed sheet. This is about to take an unexpected turn. This is, yes. Yes. It is well, yes. the bed sheet. <laughs> but yeah. it's very hard to demonstrate passion, emotion, intimacy and trust when using clinical words. And I, I'm not going to ask you what kinds of words you use during intimate encounters. I imagine Mark is very polite. <laughs> very polite. Foreign language. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And that's the thing that emotional distancing effect of using something that you haven't heard on a bus, for example, allows you to feel a little bit more refined about it. I can it. understand that, but I feel that that is very different to a use in public. I also don't think that it necessarily works to ban anything of this nature because that intrinsically makes people want to do it more. Um, Absolutely, yeah, no swearing back I mean, has ever worked Would you say to people if they were swearing in front of you, look, I'm not comfortable with this? Or, or no, I wouldn't. Or if there were children around, would you ever kind of get to the situation where you're like, oh, look, you know, there are little ears here? I actually think people have to take responsibility for their own actions. So if people want to swear, I'm not going to tell them not to because I'm not an anti-swearing police force. But at some point, I'd probably walk away because I don't think it's a very educated way to deal with a situation, mm. generally speaking. I mean, there, there is, there's some research done, isn't there, that, that where swearing can be quite useful, the stuff that you mentioned, but also uh, when we suffer pain, apparently. But it does help. If you, suffer, help. If you suffer pain, shouting out the F word, for example, apparently would relieve some of that pain, and there's been research to support that. That's right. There's uh, a chap called Dr Richard Stevens at Keele University who's been studying this for a number of years, and if you're swearing rather than using a neutral word or Recently, I did some research alongside him where we tried to find uh, a socially accepted 
acceptable form of something that sounds like swearing but isn't, one of the words we came up with was twist pipe. It does nothing to kill pain. You have to have that taboo. And it is that emotive thing. I understand Mark's sort of strong reactions because when we hear swearing or we use swearing, we're not just using the, the ordinary linguistic parts of our brain, the, the parts that we usually find on the left side of the brain. We also use very emotive parts that for most of us are found on the right side of the brain. And the reason we know this is that there are patients who've had the entire left side of their brain removed and are incapable of any other form of speech but can still swear quite fluently. OK, uh, thanks for joining yeah. us. Mark thanks Francis for keeping Vendelli. it clean uh, uh, as well. Dr Emma Byrne, thank you. Lots of you getting into having a four-year-old, actually, I'm extremely conscious about it. And mm. I think that's what people are saying. It's when mm. it's around children. Uh, we've got one here. Sophie hates swearing when I go out with my three-year-old. If anyone swears around him, I will tell them not to swear around my child as it's disrespectful. Lucy says there should be an age limit on swearing. The youngest should be 15 or 16. Well, Good luck with imposing okay. that one, though. Yeah. Well, there you go. I thought that item was going to be a load of baloney, but it wasn't in the end.